many as 200,000 victims of what's known as romance fraud every single year. Together, the victims are defrauded of an estimated £100 million annually. So tonight we have a special investigation into the problem and we reveal how undercover officers from British agencies were able to trace one particularly prolific scammer all the way to his luxurious mansion in West Africa. He was coldly targeting lonely ladies. They start paying you attention, you think you're the Queen of England. From beginning to end, it's all to do with money. Across West Africa, young men are going to extraordinary lengths to get hold of your cash. They're willing to exploit anyone, the vulnerable, the ill, the lonely. It made me feel wanted. Their key weapon, the romance scam. It's a grooming process. Somebody goes online, they're looking for companionship, they're looking to meet somebody, and the person that they meet is not who they think it really is. Romance fraudsters are conning British victims out of an estimated £100 million a year. These criminals are determined, ruthless and notoriously difficult to catch. In Portsmouth, 74-year-old Catherine was left devastated by a romance fraudster. It was 2004. I'd been on my own for a long time and... Uh just felt it would be nice to share life with someone. Online, Catherine met Richard, who said he was a Polish builder from London. We were in touch all the time. But although romance blossomed, they never met face to face. He was away on building contracts, that's why we couldn't meet. Then Richard announced he was taking a new job in Ghana. The next message was from abroad. He'd gone. From Ghana, Richard got in touch with an investment offer, which he promised would transform Catherine's life. He wanted the sum of 30,000 to start off with. He told Catherine she would double her money and asked for another 40,000 pounds. But then there was a crisis. I got a call telling me that he had been arrested. She sent more money and even flew out to Ghana. Do you think you are doing the right thing? She wasn't allowed to see Richard, but she was shown boxes of gold and cash from her supposed investment. With that, I was taken to the airport and got on the plane and came home with nothing. And once back home, a concerned friend finally convinced her she was being duped. The realisation of what had taken place devastated me. Catherine had been scammed for over £150,000. Richard had never existed, and Catherine's life savings had been pocketed by a Ghanaian fraudster. It's taken my retirement, I still have to work, and it's devastated me in many, many ways. It is very, very difficult to deal with, because they've lost everything. Bitter broken, you've got nothing. It used to be that romance fraudsters put personal ads in magazines and sent out letters. But now it's also being done online, using dating websites, chat rooms and social media. And behind fake profile pictures and flirtatious chat lie ruthless criminal gangs. Of course, to the victim, they only ever see one person but it is, it is organised crime. With romance fraud on the increase, a special unit was formed by Soccer, now part of the National Crime Agency, to trace the criminals behind the con. We had discovered that this problem was widespread in the UK, but it hadn't been picked up. We had to be able to show to police forces who wanted to investigate it, to victims who have been uh, defrauded of money, we can do something for you, and we will. The trail also led Colin to Ghana. These sacks represent all the scam mail that's been taken out. If one in a thousand answers, that's a lot of money to them. 
Crime Watch went undercover to see how the scam works. Well, hi, is that Reggie? Posing as a businessman looking for love, a member of the team responded to a number of romance scam letters. I can't wait to meet you too. Guess After a month of communicating with three women... I'm in Ghana. Our reporter planned to meet his potential love interest in a hotel lobby rigged with secret cameras and under constant police surveillance. His first date is with Reggie. Hello. Hi. I'm good, how are you? How nice to meet you. Yeah, good, thank you. What? Who, who are you, sorry? Julian. Julian. I was expecting Reggie. Yes, Reggie. You are Reggie? Yeah. Oh, you look different from the photo. Yeah, you're long time. Completely, yeah. totally, she doesn't look like you at all. Yeah. She's Chinese. She's obviously not the woman in the photo, and her real intentions soon become clear. No, I want a ticket to London. A ticket to London? Yeah. So you want to come to England? Yeah. You want me to buy your ticket? After 10 minutes, our undercover reporter reveals his suspicions. I don't think you're looking for romance. I don't think you're looking for love. I think you just want money. You're a fraudster. Caught out, she leaves. His next date is with a beautiful girl called Philomena. But she doesn't turn up. Three men do. She's not here because she's in a family meeting. They couldn't produce Philomena, but they did want paying for their expensive taxi journey. 800. Instead, our reporter confronts them. I work for the BBC. I don't believe you. I don't believe you. The men leave, only to find the police waiting outside. It was the same with the third and final date. Again, a man turned up, this time with a loaded 9mm handgun. We have had instances where people are kidnapped. It's very, very dangerous. These were organised criminal scams. Suspects were arrested and brought in for questioning. Back in the UK, Colin and his team had discovered a vital lead in exposing the identity of a prolific romance fraudster. In West Yorkshire, widow Dina White was ready to give her last penny to come to the aid of a man she had met online. He told me that his name was Steve Moon and that he was a retired army officer. He used to talk for two or three hours every night, and sometimes during the day as well. But after just one month, Steve revealed he was in Iraq and asked Dina to lend him 45,000 pounds. I know this sounds very stupid looking back on it now, but I think I'd got so involved with Steve by this time, I probably would have sent him anything. Then Steve claimed he was being held hostage. I needed £120,000 to pay off these people. Well, I, hadn't, I didn't have anything like that. The only thing I got is my house. Police were tipped off and arrived to warn Dina just days before the sale of her house went through. They told her the man she loved was the invention of a romance scammer. His photographs stolen from the internet. I'm just crying when nobody could see me. Sorry. But investigators soon realised that Dina's case was unusual. The money from a victim is normally sent via a money service bureau. Nobody knows really where it's gone. We had a really lucky break because Dina had sent her money into a bank. It was the crucial link to the fraudster behind the scam. The bank account led us to Morris Asola Fadola. In Ghana, police tracked down Fadola and arrested him. Well, he had a, a mansion which he lived in. Fancy cars, fancy watches, clothes, all of the trappings of a criminal. But despite the massive scale of Fadola's fraud, proving he was the man behind the scam was no easy matter. We see these type of frauds on industrial proportions. The money invariably travels through money service bureaus, so there's a loss of accountability there. And the problem itself is overseas from here. So in a case like this, I mean, how did you do it? We found computers, phones, SIM cards, passports, and bank accounts, and it was the bank account details which led us into it. 
Over a million pounds has gone through this bank account, all fraudulent, and this enabled us to further identify other victims. And going forward, what are the gaps that you have to close? We can't arrest our way out of this problem. We're working very closely with the dating sites, and we're working very closely with the money service bureaus so that we can better trace these flows of money. So I can tell that a victim is a victim before they even know. Colin and his team had built a strong case on paper, but they also needed victims who were willing to face Fadola in court and give evidence against him. When I was asked if I would go out to, to Ghana to go to court, I agreed because I felt it was necessary that um, we gave our evidence against this man. In total, five of Fadola's victims testified against him. It was very tough for the witnesses. They had to open up their hearts again and relive all of that emotional problems and the roller coaster they had been through. I got outside and the reaction was floods of tears. I absolutely broke down. Ultimately, the Ghanaian court only accepted the evidence of the women who testified in person. Without the bravery of victims like Catherine, Morris Azola Fadola would have walked free. Instead, he was found guilty of over 20 offences, including deception and money laundering, and jailed for five years. But for Dina, this justice comes too late. She died without knowing whether the man who had stolen her money and shattered her hopes would ever be punished. We worked on this case for over six years. The court case alone took three years. And there was no way that we were going to give up. For so long, they weren't caught because nobody was looking for them. Now we've shown that it can happen, it will happen more and more. The problem is that for every one of these fraudsters painstakingly brought to justice, there are thousands of others trying their luck and getting away with it. He was running an army of people. Any one of those could stand up and say, we'll just go and do this on our own. There are more Fadolas out there, many more. Well, what about that? I'm joined now by Professor Monica Huissi, who is what's known as a cyber psychologist, and she's one of the UK's leading authorities on romance scams, and by Steve Prophet, the deputy head of Action Fraud. Welcome uh, to both of you. Uh, Monica, to you first. You've done some really pioneering research in this area. Can you just quantify the scale of this problem? Yeah, well, we found at least 200,000 victims in the UK every year become defrauded by this scam, and those are the individuals that know about it. It's both men, maybe slightly more men than women, all age groups, both heterosexual and homosexual, educated, non-educated, professional, non-professional. So it spans all of us and everywhere. Um, Steve, we live so much of our life online and that's increasing. This is not going to go away, this problem, is it? It's not going to go away. With the increasing use of the internet and social media, the opportunity for criminals to target victims is only going to increase. Um, well, we can hear briefly now from another very recent romance fraud victim, this woman who's asked to remain anonymous. Well, she met a man online last year. He told her that he was an American serviceman based in the UK and that he was about to leave for Syria. The messages and the letters were all very romantic. It was poetry, nice, loving letters, and it's something that a girl always dreams of, but you never ever have in reality. Then the demands for different amounts of money started to come through more and more. I just looked at the bank account and it was basically empty. I lost in the region of 50,000 pounds altogether. I mean that